war in Israel takes a pause, the world takes another shot at dealing with climate, and we say goodbye to two giants, one in diplomacy and the other in investment. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week's special contributor Larry Summers on the legacies of Henry Kissinger and Charlie Munger. Jean-Yves Fillon of BNP Paribas on what his clients are telling him. Part of them are expecting actually to access capital markets at a later time when our rates normalize. And Joe Sitt of Thor Equities on the investment opportunities in Mexico. We think this is another one of those golden opportunities where we're early. Global Wall Street watched this week as Israel's war with Hamas went on a temporary hiatus as Israel stopped its military operations in a deal that brought some of the hostages home. The approach that we're taking with Israel and quite frankly with our partners in the region uh, is working. It's getting aid in to people that need it. And Elon Musk used the opportunity to travel to the war zone to counter accusations that his post on X was anti-Semitic and to offer to help rebuild Gaza once things are over. Those who are intent on murder must be neutralized. Then the propaganda must stop. The world gathered in Dubai for COP28 in the latest efforts to get a move on in dealing with climate, with U.S. officials once again expressing hope. I'm confident that COP will provide an opportunity both to identify the opportunities that this, this energy transition is providing and to build the broad international coalition. Even as more than 70,000 delegates were talking about fossil fuels, OPEC Plus met in Vienna to review restrictions on oil production. It could be simply that uh, OPEC Plus decides to curtail uh, supply and we get uh, a Brent going back up to the low 90s as a result of that. It's a question of how much they curtail supply by, but that's the biggest risk right now. Two towering figures on Global Wall Street said goodbye this week. As America's foremost diplomat for a generation and more, Henry Kissinger left us at the age of 100. And Warren Buffett's longtime partner, Charlie Munger, passed away at age 99. On the economic front, the United States continued its strong performance with GDP growing at a robust 5.2 percent clip. And when you put that strong economic performance together with a Fed that seems to be signaling it may well be done with hiking, well, what you get are some pretty happy markets as the S&P 500 added another eight-tenths of a percent to end the week at 45.94, which is above where the Bloomberg elves, equities, and the analysts thought we would end up 2023. And by that way, above even where they think we're going to be, end up at the end of 2024, which is 4,500. The Nasdaq was up four-tenths of a percent for the week, while the yield on the 10-year was down nearly 26 basis points for the week to end at 4.21. For her perspective on these markets and what they are telling us about investing today, we welcome now Catherine Keating. She's BNY Mellon Global Head of Wealth Management. Catherine, welcome back. Great to have you back on Wall Street. Great to be here, David. Thank you. So let's start with some of those data. I mean, we got some really robust data we talked about this week, but it's, not, it's just the latest and quite a few uh, series of data that are pretty encouraging about the economy. Yeah, so the real story in markets has been the month of November, obviously, and, and the market's digesting really four pieces of important data. The first one, of course, inflation. Inflation continues to go down, but we see disinflation broadening. We see it in goods, we see it in services, and we see it in big ticket items like shelter and automobiles. So that's the first thing, inflation. Second thing, labor market, softening a bit. That's a good sign for lower inflation as well. We see um, the unemployment rate drifting up a bit, 3.9%, still very low historically. Unemployment claims drifting up a bit. Um, and then the real news, I think, was the following. The bond market digesting that huge move in 10-year Treasury rates in the month of November, 60 basis points down from a 488. Uh, down 60 to 428. That's an enormous move in financing costs, not just for the federal government, of course, but for anyone who borrows, consumers with mortgages and car loans, um, local governments, companies, um, very big news. And then the last thing that the market was digesting is after three quarters in a row of negative earnings growth in the S&P 500, we actually had positive earnings this quarter. 4% growth, 80% of companies beating expectations. So the market digested all of that, and you said it. We had a rally at everything. So I want to say I find this a little humbling, because if you go back to the end of 2022, I'm not sure we would have predicted any of this. So why did so many of us get this so wrong? So, David, as you know, history has taught us that when you have inflation in the economy and you have the Federal Reserve 
raising interest rates to slow the economy, 90% of the time you end up in a recession. So here we are, we're 20 months in to a very fast and very aggressive Fed hiking cycle and there's no recession in sight. Why is that? I think many people underappreciated the change in two pillars of the economy, consumers and large companies. Consumers, of course, 70% of the economy. The consumer balance sheet has changed dramatically since the financial crisis. First, consumers are twice as wealthy, 20% wealthier just since the beginning of this decade, thanks to stock markets and real estate appreciation. Second of all, um, they've been borrowing less. The financial crisis was a terrible crisis for the consumer. They've been borrowing much more prudently. You see, you know, 10% or so of their disposable income now going uh, to borrowing costs. That was close to 15% before the financial crisis. But the most important thing when you look at consumer balance sheets is, is two thirds of consumer borrowing is their mortgage. Mm. Those mortgages have been refinanced at very low rates. They're gonna stay that way for a while. Corporate America, sort of the same thing. Big companies, before the crisis, they would borrow in short-term markets, commercial paper. Those rates are very high now. Companies aren't doing that. Instead, they did what consumers did, and they took advantage of low rates in 2020 and 2021, the S&P 500, taking um, refinancing debt, issuing new debt at low rates and terming it. Four years, five years, six years, 10 years. Um, and so that, that has made both the consumer and large companies less sensitive to interest rate increases. So what does this tell you at BNY Mellon about next year? What is your outlook for next year? Yeah, so our outlook for next year, we, we would call it a healthy slowdown. We've obviously had a very fast start to this decade mm -hmm. with lots of um, big and important events. And we look at uh, next year as you know, possibly the first sort of more normal year that we're gonna see in the market. We think that inflation will continue to drift down, but perhaps not as rapidly as it has um, you know, in, the last, uh, in the last year. We think that the Fed will probably lower rates next year. We're expecting more like two rate cuts, however. The market is expecting four. We hope the market is right, because lower rates are good for everybody, but we're not sure about that. Um, we think that um, large companies will continue to have earnings growth. We think maybe 8% or so next year. The market thinks 12. That would be great if the market is right. We're a little more um, conservative. And so we see positive outlook for equity markets, you know, call it 6 to 8% next year here in U.S. large cap. Um, we see a positive outlook for bond markets because you have yield, plus if you have rate cuts, you have appreciation. Yeah. Um, and we wouldn't be surprised, actually, if people had higher returns on their bonds than they did on their stocks next year. So, Catherine, one last question. You talk about equity markets and bond markets. I suspect you're talking about public markets. Correct. What about private markets? Because that's all the news these days. So much money is going to private equity, private credit. So you, you, you are referencing a real change in market structure over you know, the last 20, 30 years, right? If we think about public stock markets over you know, the last 20, 30 years, there were you know, 8,000 public companies back then. Now there are 4,000. <laughs> You look at the private equity world, there are 16,000 companies that are owned by private equity firms and funds. So market structure has changed, and individual investors should invest like institutions, right? Mm. We're all responsible for our financial futures. We're investing with long-term time horizons. And you see companies in those private market years, you know, they tend to be smaller, they tend to grow faster. You want to get access to that. Um, and you need, and you know, another theme about markets is they've become more complicated. You need to work with an advisor to do that. Son of a gun. Do you have some of those? We have some of those. <laughs> but, we have some of those. But yes, it's, we it's do. It's a complicated world out there. And it is a complicated world out there. You some professionals trying to advise you us do. all. Yeah, exactly. We do. We Catherine, do. Catherine, it's really great to have you back on. Thank you so much. That's Catherine Keating of BNY Mellon. Coming up, we turn to our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, for his thoughts on the lives and legacies of two towering figures, Henry Kissinger and Charlie Munger. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We welcome now our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. Larry, thank you so much for being with us here in New York. It has been quite a week uh, where we lost Charlie Munger, we lost, uh, uh, we lost uh, Henry Kissinger, and then on Friday we actually lost Sandra Day O'Connor as well. I know you knew Henry well, you knew Charlie Munger. Talk about uh, Henry Kissinger and your experience. He was an extraordinary man. It was extraordinary to see somebody 
in their 80s and then in their 90s and then 100 years old. So incredibly intellectually vital, looking to learn about uh, AI, speaking to most of the world's leading statesmen every uh, several months. He was fully engaged and active in the way that many people half his age uh, wouldn't have had the energy and uh, the drive to do. He was somebody who always thought in the large first, understanding the broad historical forces that were shaping relationships between countries, from that forming a conception of strategy, from that conception of strategy working uh, to uh, tactics. It was anything but the day-to-day -day political thrust of statements that so often seems to preoccupy uh, leaders these days. He surely didn't get everything right, but he certainly was always trying to reason from the large uh, to reason down. And I learned from his deeply, in a way, tragic uh, sensibility. Um, he was the idealist as realist. He and the, real, and the realist as idealist. Henry, maybe because of how and where he grew up uh, in Germany in the 1930s, feared disorder, feared chaos, feared the complete triumph of passion over reason. And his determination was to bring about stability not because he somehow thought that the pride of nations and strength was what was most important, but because when there was the containment of evil, that was when people had an opportunity to live and uh, flourish. And those were powerful, uh, pow powerful ideas. He was an, he was a, figure who was also very generous to people who he had no compelling reason uh, to uh, be generous uh, to. He was as impressive and extraordinary a person as I've known. He was also in many ways as complex a person as uh, I have uh, known. Yeah, I must say, I was one of the beneficiaries of that because for reasons that are unknown to me, he sort of adopted me a little bit when I came to New York and invited me to various events where we learned about, about the economic world and the world of geopolitics where I otherwise wouldn't have. Charlie Munger, uh, the partner of Warren Buffett, important. How, what effect did he have on investing uh, writ large? You know, I think the first thing to say is that Charlie and Henry had something very important in common. They had different interests, they had different uh, styles, they had different ways of speaking. But they both had a deep commitment to seeing the world as it was, hmm. not as they wanted it to be. And they began by trying to see things as realistically, as clinically accurately as possible. And that was the basis for decision, whether it was political and diplomatic decision in Henry's case, whether it was financial and investment decision in Charlie's uh, case, what I got from both of them was this commitment to detached observation as a prelude to uh, taking uh, action. You know, by um, Warren's testimony, uh, Charlie provided a really extraordinary insight. Um, he said, and it's different than the old fashioned and traditional value investing credo, Charlie rejected the idea of buying uh, fair companies at great prices. He thought you'd ultimately do better buying right. great companies at fair prices. Right. And that philosophy of finding the best making sure you weren't overpaying and then sticking with it 
is one that has certainly served certainly served him and certainly served uh, Warren uh, well. But I saw it. Charlie was an was an involved alum of Harvard Law School while I was uh, the president yeah. of Harvard, and he had a view. Yeah. It was clear. There was a logic. He was prepared right. to argue right. and uh, <clears throat> defend it. Uh, he too was an extraordinary uh, figure, and right. you have to also look at both Henry and right. Charlie, and see the power of staying curious. Yeah. They stayed yeah. with it to the very end. And yeah. I think their curiosity, their love of reading, their love of right. discussion, their love of yeah. argument was part of what caused them to flourish for so very long. Well, it may be a reach, but I think you're uh, really emulating that uh, in staying curious as you've now taken I've, this role with OpenAI. You talk about Henry Kissinger with OpenAI, you're taking it on. Let me ask you, frankly, why did you take the job and what do you hope to do with it? I thought that, as I said on your show, that this was something that was extraordinarily important. You know, no one can be certain whether this is a once a decade technology, a once a half century technology, a once a century technology, a once a millennium uh, technology. No one can know that for sure, but it sure looks like it's awfully important to develop rapidly and safely and to disseminate effectively and well. So when I was offered an opportunity to be part of contributing to that, and overseeing to make sure that that was um, effectively done and to do it working with some very great people, I thought it was a real opportunity and I was glad to do it. I don't want to take anything away from your technological expertise, but when in what you just said safely strikes me as probably part of what you're going to be focused on. And that gets to questions of governance, about how you handle this technology, wherever it's going, and however powerful it may be. Do you have an overall sense of what you need to do to govern it to get the safely part right? You know, David, I've been on the job two days and <laughs> They're going to send me the onboarding packet for uh, the board on Sunday. So I shouldn't be uh, saying too much uh, at all because I don't, I don't know enough. Here's some things I think I know. I think I know that a company like this has to be prepared to cooperate. Doesn't mean always agree with, but cooperate with key government officials on regulatory issues, on national security uh, issues, on development of uh, technology uh, issues. I think I know also, and this is integral to the structure of uh, open AI, where the for-profit entity is itself a creature of a not-for-profit um, uh, entity that this needs to be a corporation with a conscience and that we need to be always thinking about the multiple stakeholders in the development of this technology and as a board member that will be part of my responsibility working with other uh, board members uh, to make uh, to make that uh, certain you know my colleague uh, at Harvard late colleague Ken Galbraith said that conscience is the knowledge that someone is watching. Hmm. And I think it's the responsibility for everybody involved in this to be thinking very carefully always about both opportunities and uncertainties and uh, to make sure that those are balanced in the best way uh, that's possible. It's fascinating. Well, I, I wish you luck as we all do, because as you've said on this program, it's a powerful, really powerful engine, particularly, and could do an awful lot of good. At the same time, we have to be careful about it. Do you think it's still coming from the cognitive class? You said that once on this program. I think, yeah, I think one of the reasons, I think one thing that people should keep in mind yeah. as they read all the press about this is this is a technology 
that does what reporters and journalists uh, do. Now you're hitting close to home. (laughs) Reporters and journalists may view it slightly differently than when it's technologies that are potentially affecting what some other people do. And by the way, a few lawyers too, by the way. Absolutely. (laughs) I'm doubly vulnerable here. Absolutely. Larry, it's really great to have you with us, as it always is. That is our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. And this is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. thought of foreign policy and economic policy as something that has clear-cut terminal uh, dates and that you are either in a condition of conflict or in a condition of blissful peace. In the 90s, if we do it properly, we will live in a less dangerous world, but one which will never be totally without problems and in which the subtlety of American of American statesmanship in adjusting the various balances, both political and economic, will be severely tested Uh, But uh, if we do it well, it could be an extraordinarily creative period. Henry Kissinger defined the world of diplomacy for two generations, remaking the geopolitical map of Asia and the Middle East. A Jewish refugee who fled Nazi Germany for the United States, Kissinger returned as a U.S. Army private to serve in the Battle of the Bulge. After the war, Kissinger became Dr. Kissinger when he earned a Ph.D. in political science and then joined the Harvard faculty. When Richard Nixon became president in 1969, he appointed Henry Kissinger as his national security advisor and used him to open a window to China that made the current economic miracle possible. To most people in 1968-69, it seemed inconceivable that the U.S. could have a relationship with such an extreme, zealous regime as, as Mao Zedong's. Remember, the Cultural Revolution was in full spade, and most people thought the regime was just nuts. So the very idea of trying to establish a relationship was a minority pursuit. Kissinger also negotiated a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt and a ceasefire with Syria. That brought calm to a region that had been upended by wars since the end of World War II. Kissinger also played the lead role in negotiating an end to the United States' involvement in a conflict in Vietnam, which earned him the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973. Dr. Kissinger's role in the world was not without controversy. He was accused of pursuing an illegal military offensive in Laos and Cambodia, as well as playing a role in coups in Chile and Argentina that resulted in repressive regimes. And this is the thing that critics of Henry Kissinger have always struggled with. They've been very bad at setting the uh, crimes of a Pinochet in the context of the Cold War. When you see it in the context of the Cold War, you realize that the war crimes, uh, the, the crimes against humanity being perpetrated by communist regimes were on a much larger scale than those that were perpetrated by regimes of the right. And this is really the important thing one has to bear in mind. Henry Kissinger said even before he went into government that foreign policy was very often a choice between evils and the job was to try to choose the lesser evil. Every president since Nixon turned to Henry Kissinger for advice on foreign policy. He was the author of influential books from his first on Europe in the wake of Napoleon, published in 1957, up to Leadership, Six Studies in World Strategies, published last year. Supply chains. Until the pandemic struck, most of us gave them little thought, apart from those working in shipping and procurement. But then we were hit with the reality that critical supplies for healthcare and much more came from one country, China, presenting the need to diversify. These supply chains are complicated. Your viewers know this from the business world that, look, the semiconductor value chain, it stretches across the globe and goes around at least three times. Now companies and countries are moving quickly to reinforce and diversify their supply chains, with President Biden this week announcing a White House Council on Supply Chain Resilience. Let me be clear. Any corporation that's not 
brought their prices back down, even as inflation has come down, even as supply chains have been rebuilt. It's time to stop the price gouging. And with the new emphasis on alternative suppliers comes the movement of capital and investment, creating investment alternatives to China. I think some of the emerging markets outside of China have done relatively well. Uh, these include places like India, include places like Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, and even some places in Eastern Europe like Greece uh, and even Poland. These countries have done well. Still relatively small to absorb too much capital, but you can see that this sort of new era is beginning. It takes a while. One of the beneficiaries is Mexico, whether it's in trade. The main issue with China is exports. They've declined significantly in terms of what they export to the U.S. over the last five years. And that I think until they can turn that around, that's going to be an issue. And there's other countries that are benef benefiting from this, like Mexico with its nearshoring. Or in real estate. I would say there's great opportunity is um, in Mexico in the industrial space and particularly along the border and you have a lot of multinational companies that are located there looking for um, logistics and distribution type space. Or in manufacturing. There are going to be markets that kind of in Mexico where you know m more things are being made there again and some of the uh, the restrictions that have been applied to China have benefited the Mexican economy. Putting Mexico high on Jamie Dimon's list of investment opportunities. We've doubled or tripled our capital here in the last six years. We cover more clients in private banking, investment banking, uh, asset management. So our commitment is total. I think it's one of the great opportunities. I'd put Mexico, you know, if you had to pick a country, this might be the number one opportunity. To give us the investor's perspective on Mexico, we welcome now Joseph Sitt. He's founder and chairman of Thor Equities, whose Thor Urban Unit is the largest real estate developer in Mexico. So, Joe, thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you. First of all, give us a sense of just how big you are in Mexico. Uh, in terms of the company, we're probably the largest individual developer in the retail asset class, in the hospitality asset class, and then because we're in so many things from industrial, manufacturing, condominiums, et cetera, et cetera, we're probably top two, top three developer in the country today. So why are you there? Opportunity, and I would call it both opportunity, growth, and alternative. Um, when you think of the world and the world, how things are changing, Mexico is becoming quite the answer to some of the United States' economic problems. And by being that solution, it's been wonderful for them. Uh, as a country, I would say it's four things that really make up their economy, their drive. One is their local specialty assets, I call it. It's avocados, <laughs> it's tequila, and it's beer. We know it as, you know, going out and having that drink and, of beer and having uh, the dip and, have, uh, and the tequila, et cetera, et cetera. But it really is a, a product that's been growing. I mean, if you think of tequila 30 years ago, did you really go to a bar and hear a friend order a tequila? Not really. And so me Mexican culture has gone global. It's gone viral. Sort of what happened to sushi 40 or 50 years ago happened in Mexico. And then the second thing is remittances. You know, a lot of Mexicans and Americans, because of the close relationship between our countries, really transverse back and forth. And then probably the thing that's been the buzzword for the last 30 or 60 days is nearshoring. You know, we uh, as a country, we see the world um, sort of bifurcating, multipolar conflict. Mexico's a great solution. It's right here in our backyard. It's easy. Labor is actually cheaper than labor is in China. The people are hardworking, they're industrious. The commuting point, the logistics for a container ship is free relative to shipping it from China. And so it's really become the Chinese alternative. How does that translate into investing in real estate in Mexico? Are we talking about uh, commercial real estate? Are we talking about industrial? Are we talking about residential? All of the above? Where are you putting your money? Uh, we were heavily in retail. We believed in it as an emerging market country. And so when we started in the country, we started off on a little street in a neighborhood called Polanco in Mexico City, Masarique, started building six different projects, commuting back and forth from New York. And then we sort of exploded. Uh, we wanted to deliver for them the same quality of life, lifestyle centers we saw in the United States. 
I had a friend, Rick Caruso, um, who was almost mayor in L.A., probably would have been great for L.A., took me for a tour of a project he did actually in Los Angeles. And I was fascinated by seeing how many Mexicans were in there and enjoying it, Mexican nationalities that were either tourists or local working. And that's when it dawned on me. Why can't I bring what Rick Caruso did in the United States and California and bring that to all of Mexico? And then it just grew from there. It sort of snowballed. We started saying, you know, it's a great place to visit, but I don't really love the hotels that I'd stay in. And so we started then building the hotels. And then nowadays it's, it's taking advantage of the nearshoring. It's multidimensional. First, it's direct to consumer companies that maybe they bring in the merchandise from a foreign country or manufacture it in Mexico and then ship directly to Americans right from there. Or number two, the auto industry. Auto industry has been growing and growing and the demand in the United States has been tremendous. And then last but not least is I would say advanced manufacturing. Um, Mexico sometimes is thought of as a little bit of a backwards manufacturing country but they've gotten so much more sophisticated, shockingly so uh, to some people, not to myself. But when you look at medical products, EV, battery manufacturing, Mexico's right up there just as good, if not better, than building in China. So, Joe, uh, you've described uh, an investment opportunity, a big investment opportunity in Mexico. Typically, it was an opportunity, money rushes in, capital rushes in, and it becomes fully priced. Where are we in that cycle? How far, how close are we to fully pricing the assets in Mexico so it's not quite the deal it was before? Excellent question. And often people generalize by the country, but you've got to also look at the specifics, meaning by the asset classes. For example, nearshoring, you had 120 companies announce um, investments in Mexico so far the first half of this year, about $29 billion um, in U.S. dollar investment, the 41% increase from last year. Based upon the early research, it's looking like next year is going to double on that. Mm. So I would say from the industrial opportunity, I think we're in the very, very early innings of it, probably the earliest innings amongst the different food groups. Um, in fact, one of the things uh, I've often bumped into my challenges with investors, as well as sometimes, as we said, the media is we're often at Thor, sometimes a little bit too early. Mm. We, we, we don't try to be the first. As I often say, we try to be the fastest second. But it's not until you're the third or fourth or fifth that the investors get it. And uh, same thing happened with us in investing in Dubai, as you and I had spoken about, you know, four years ago. Same thing happened to us talking about red states versus the blue states and investing in red states 15 years ago. And we think this is another one of those golden opportunities where we're early. We're just in the beginning of the second inning with a lot of runway. And those investors that act quickly now to mine that opportunity will get that benefit. If they wait, call it three years or four years or five years, mm -hmm. then it starts getting priced in. Mm -hmm. I would say retail is probably already priced in. And I would say uh, condominiums, second home tourism while growing is probably somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. there. So I would say ahead of the curve is industrial, probably already valued well is retail and uh, um, as I often joke, forgive the expression to my team, I say um, ri uh, uh, ride the uh, horses, um, feed the lions and shoot the dogs. <laughs> I would call the office market there probably the dog and I would say the industrial market is probably the lion. Joe, you're clearly bullish on Mexico as an investment opportunity. Compare it with some alternatives. We had Steve Schwartzman just this week say he thought when it came to real estate, Europe was a great opportunity right now. How do you compare Mexico with Europe with some Asian alternatives? Um, well, Steve is a friend. I'm a fan of him and John Gray, both super smart guys. We, we often compare notes and look at ourselves as a miniature version thematic investor um, that, that then develops specialties in different areas. So I don't doubt what he's saying. Um, we've got an office in most of the major metropolitan cities inside of Europe, very active market for us. But I would say a lot of the early low hanging fruit in Europe has been mined, but where the opportunity in, Mex in Europe is much more because of the dislocation because of financial markets.
So, Joe, what about geopolitics, and particularly politics when it comes to Mexico? That's often been an issue for investors. We have an election coming up. Where does that stand today? You know, when AMLO was going through his election cycle, it scared the BGBs out of local players and, candidly, myself. AMLO then came in, and he sounded good. He was a good hearer of what people were saying, but wasn't a good listener, I'm sorry to say. And so I really think that Mexico did well in spite of itself. Um, now, the politics is much better. Either way, we're getting a woman for the first time as the president of Mexico. It'll either be Claudia Scheinbaum or it'll be Social Galvez. Both of them pro-business, listeners, um, touching their communities and really caring about their constituents at all levels and not just considering uh, rhetoric to be the answer. They're thoughtful about the jobs, et cetera. So I would say that's probably my overall number one most exciting thing today that I'm about, uh, that I'm excited about, about the future of Mexico for the business community. Joe, thank you so much for being on Wall Street Week. I hope you come back. This is great. That is Joe Sitt of Thor Equities. Coming up, what banking clients are excited and concerned about. We talk with the Vice Chairman of BNP Paribas U.S., Jean-Yves Fillon. We've had, and we have today, unprecedented demand from clients as it relates to hedging strategies. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Numbers out this week told us once again that the United States economy remains strong despite all those rate cuts, even as some predict a slowdown going into the new year. For his views on the economy, monetary policy, and what his clients are telling him, we welcome now Jean-Yves Fillon. He is vice chairman of BNP Paribas U.S. So Jean-Yves, thank you so much for being with us. Really thank appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, David. So give us your perspective. You have sort of a unique perspective because you have a substantial U.S. operation. You have a lot of prominent U.S. clients. At the same time, you're a bank originally based in Paris, that's where you're based. So what is your perception on the economy in the United States and for that matter globally? We have a very resilient economy in the United States, uh, driven by uh, steel, uh, strong uh, consumption, the consumer spends, uh, driven by a tight labor market, driven by uh, the velocity of capital in this country is just uh, amazing and strong capital markets, which really leads to making the uh, uh, U.S. economy a very attractive place domestically and overseas. For years now, we have been, I'll say, dependent on the central bank, both the United States and to some extent as well in Europe. Are we coming to a world where the economy can sort of survive on its own without worrying day to day about what the Fed is going to do or what we think it's going to do? Well, I think we, 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 we are very vigilant about what the central banks do, right? And they have a very noble objective. It's first and foremost to protect uh, employment and to uh, ensure price stability. Price stability is a bedrock of any sustainable economy. And this is what the Fed and the ECB have been doing in quite a similar way, actually, uh, in terms of uh, uh, hiking rates uh, in terms of, for the Fed specifically, implementing QT. Very likely, both institutions uh, have set rates probably at their terminal level. Mm. Um, the House view is, in spite of the resilience of this economy, likely a mild recession in the United States, slowing down in Europe. We, know it, we don't expect any rate cuts probably until mid-2024. So how does that affect the clients that you deal with day in and day out? Are their appetite for loans, their hesitancy about getting loans, particularly if we're looking at possibly a mild turndown and higher interest rates. So there's a real cost of capital now. It is, and there is, however, clients who have had uh, systematic access to capital markets have managed to term out uh, a significant part of the, the indentures, which, which explain why the impact of the arkish policies of the central banks have not yet fully impacted uh, corporate America. And uh, part, of, part of them are expecting actually to access capital markets at a later time when uh, rates, uh, we hope, they hope normalize. And that's one aspect. But it's similar as well for consumers. You know, uh, 
people who have contracted mortgages years ago still benefit fixed rate for, from a low rate uh, uh, in terms of cost of funding and have not been yet really impacted at this time, which explains probably why the consumer continues to be quite active. You've said, Jean-Yves, that it is a strong economy, particularly in the United States right now. Uh, what about growth? Where does it go from here? Because that must affect the demand that your clients have for borrowing, for example, uh, to invest in growth. Do they, are they optimistic about what comes next so that it makes sense for them to invest for the future? Clients are optimistic in spite of the headwinds and specifically geopolitics and politics. They invest, they expand. Uh, interestingly, uh, what we see from our U.S. clients is really around three dimensions. They still need lending uh, to finance capex programs or acquisition finance or expansions. They need short-term funding. Uh, working capital needs have become a C-suite discussions because this is the lifeblood of these companies. And it's across trade. It's across cash management. We lead in trade worldwide. We lead in cash management in Europe, supporting U.S. company there. And supply chain remains a topic of uh, focus, uh, specifically uh, for clients who are reallocating or clients who need liquidity to be injected to make the process smoother. Candidly, we, we've been very active assisting clients to shift from the not possible anymore just in time to what we call the just in case. But mm -hmm. David, I would be remiss if I were not highlighting the fact that we've had and we have today unprecedented demand from clients as it relates to hedging strategies. Mm -hmm. And it's across the spectrum. It's rates, Akish policy, it's commodities, the status of energy, it's currencies, we've seen more volatility in currencies, and obviously it's, a, it's equities. As I say, you have a unique perspective uh, with sort of a foot in both worlds, the United States as well as a foot still in Europe. How would you compare and contrast the attitudes and the appetites of your U.S. clients from what your brothers and sisters are seeing over in Europe? Uh, very interestingly, we see U.S. clients, the most international ones, showing strong interest in terms of expanding, investing, or raising capital in Europe. The strong dollar is a factor, but not only. Uh, an example, David, uh, a very large, you will recognize this company, global leader in the semiconductor. You know, having already implemented a large repatriation, uh, supply chain repatriation program in the U.S. and at the same time is expanding and building and expanding uh, production capacity in Europe. The bank is uniquely positioned to support and lead and underwrite both programs. Mm -hmm. Um, we, but, but, but conversely, um, a very significant number of European clients show massive interest to invest in the United States. The resilience of the economy, the you know, uh, still high rates providing good you know, return on capital. And what, what I see from the position I have between the two continents is um, a very significant continuing and continuous inflow of capital from outside of the United States into this country, meaning either the money gets invested, and by the way, government programs like IRA, CHIPS Act, Infrastructure Act has, have created a very significant inflow of transactions, uh, and the money that stays on the sideline, uh, there is a, a very important dry powder that is being built. Uh, that will be used uh, effectively when things normalized. Jean Yves, it's really wonderful to have you on Wall Street. Really. Thank you very much for joining us. That's Jean Yves Fillon of BNP Paribas. Coming up, telling the difference between what's fake and what's not, with or without artificial intelligence. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Authentic, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as worthy of acceptance or belief as conforming to or based on fact. And Merriam-Webster has also deemed it to be the word of the year, explaining that the line between real and fake has become increasingly blurred, which may just be the understatement of the year. Certainly some in the tech community seem to be struggling with the difference. 
Sponsors canceled a software developer conference this week after speakers' profiles on the website turned out to be fake, leading several tech executives to pull out, including one from Microsoft, who posted that he had been duped by the fake speakers. There was a lot of concern that there was a plot to make the account look, or to make the conference look more diverse than it really was. The once vaunted Sports Illustrated took down articles from its site after allegations it had used artificial intelligence not only to write the stories, but also to credit them to fictitious reporters complete with profiles, something SI's parent company denies but says it is investigating, further blurring that line between the authentic and the fake. But all of that is nothing compared with the current poster child for confusing fact with fiction, Congressman George Santos from Long Island. Representative Santos continues to claim that life is treating him unfairly even after an indictment and a move by his colleagues to expel him from the House of Representatives for making up more things than we have time to go through. Pursuant to Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2 of the Constitution of the United States, Representative George Santos B and he hereby is expelled from the House of Representatives. In the world of business, Elon Musk certainly has his work cut out for him sorting through over 100 million posts on his ex-social media site to separate what's true from what's not. And for that matter, what's just downright malicious. But for Musk, right now, the problem isn't so much what's false as what is undeniably true, like the fact that he reposted something that much of the world regarded as anti-Semitic, which triggered advertisers like Apple, Disney, and IBM to pull their money from the site. This company X, Twitter, has spent months basically doing damage control over Elon Musk's post. Apparently as a make good, Mr. Musk traveled to a war zone this week and offered to help rebuild Gaza once the fighting has stopped. Those who are intended murder must, must be neutralized. Uh, then uh, the, the propaganda must stop. Well, I hope you'll be involved in it, and I'd love to help. As Mr. Musk struggled to deal with how he's marketing X, another business leader took a very different approach. One of the great brand builders of our time, Martha Stewart, has, of course, made a series of TV commercials with Snoop Dogg. Do I smell? That's right, fondue time. And then posed for the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition at the age of 81. Now, Ms. Stewart has taken yet another step to keep her profile high, this time by offering a stay at a two-bedroom cottage on her estate in Bedford, New York, through Airbnb, complete with a brunch with Martha herself, all at the bargain basement price of $11.23. Talk about marketing. The world was reminded this week of just what the word authentic really means when it comes to investing with the passing of Charlie Munger at the age of 99. As the longtime partner of Warren Buffett, Charlie made money for Berkshire Hathaway shareholders the old-fashioned way. He earned it by doing his homework, making a few big decisions and staying with them. And in the process, made historic returns. When it comes to Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, there was no fiction. It was all fact. I think I fixed one flaw in my life. I got over having tantrums when I was about four or five. But every other flaw I have, I haven't fixed. I've just counterbalanced it with... <laughs> offsetting virtues. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.